No one had asked for help. That was the problem. They'd just gone around talking, eating, or staring into the air while their parents gossiped. For whatever odd reason, no one had been sitting down reading a book, which meant she couldn't just sit down next to them and take out her own book. Aside from helping people with their homework, or anything else they needed, she really didn't know how to meet people. She didn't feel like she was a shy person. She thought of herself as a take-charge sort of girl. And yet, somehow, if there wasn't some request along the lines of, I can't remember how to do long division, then it was just too awkward to go up to someone and say, What? But let it be quite clear that Hermione Granger, sitting alone on the first day of school in one of the last few cabins that had been empty, in the last car at the train, was not sad, lonely, gloomy, depressed, despairing, or obsessing about her problems. She was, rather, rereading Hogwarts A History for the third time and quite enjoying it, with only a faint tinge of annoyance in the back of her mind. There was the sound of an inter-train door opening, and then footsteps coming down the hallway of the train. Hermione stuck her head outside, just in case someone needed help, and saw a young boy. Excuse me, can I ask a quick question? Does anyone here know the six quarks, or where I can find a first-year girl named Hermione Granger? Up, down, strange, charm, truth, beauty. Why are you looking for a first-year girl named Hermione Granger? Ah, so you're a first-year girl named Hermione Granger. Technically, all I needed to do was look for you, but it seems likely that I meant to talk to you, or invite you to join my party, or get a key magical item from you, or find out that Hogwarts was built over the ruins of an ancient temple, or something. PC or NPC? That is the question. I didn't say I was Hermione Granger. I didn't say you said you were Hermione Granger. I just said you were Hermione Granger. If you're asking how I know, it's because I know everything. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Harry James Potter Evans Varys, or Harry Potter for short. I know that probably doesn't mean anything to you for a change. Hermione's mind finally made the connection. Harry Potter, you're in modern magical history and the rise and fall of dark arts and great wizarding events of the 20th century. You were born to James Potter and Lily Potter, formerly Lily Evans, on July 31st, 1980. On October 31st, 1981, the Dark Lord, he who must not be named, though I don't know why not, attacked your home, whose location was betrayed by Sirius Black, though it doesn't say how they knew it was him. You were found alive with a scar on your forehead in the ruins of your parents' house near the burnt remains of you-know-who's body. Chief Warlock Albus Percival Wolfric Brian Dumbledore sent you off somewhere, no one knows where. The rise and fall of the Dark Arts claims that you survived because of your mother's love, and that your scar contains all the Dark Lord's magical power, and that the centaurs fear you. But great wizarding events of the 20th century doesn't mention anything like that, and modern magical history warns that there are a lot of crackpot theories about you. Do you have an eidetic memory, Hermione? It's not photographic. I've always wished it was, but I had to read my school books five times over in order to memorize them all. Really? I should like to make you a proposition, Miss Granger. The boy reached into his pouch and said, Can of soda, retrieving a bright green cylinder. Can I offer you something to drink? Hermione politely accepted the soda. In fact, she was feeling sort of thirsty by now. I'd like you to help me take over the universe. N no thank you. I'm not evil. Well, I was speaking a bit rhetorically. In the sense of the Baconian project, you know, not political power. The effecting of all things possible, and so on. I want to conduct experimental studies of spells, figure out the underlying laws, bring magic into the domain of science. With your encyclopedic memory added to my intelligence and rationality, we'll have the Baconian project finished in no time. Where by no time, I mean probably at least 35 years. Hermione was beginning to find this boy annoying. I haven't seen you do anything intelligent. Maybe I'll let you help me with my research. Allow me to warn you that challenging my ingenuity is a dangerous sort of project and may tend to make your life a lot more surreal. I'm not impressed yet. Well, maybe this will impress you. I've already done a bit of experimenting and I found that I don't need the wand. I can make anything I want happen just by snapping my fingers. It came just as Hermione was in the middle of swallowing, and she choked and coughed and expelled the bright green fluid. Onto her brand new, never-worn witch's robes on the very first day of school. Ah! My clothes! Don't panic! I can fix it for you! Just watch! He raised a hand and snapped his fingers. <laughs> then she looked down at herself. It was like she'd never spilled anything. Wordless, wandless magic. At his age? Then she remembered what she'd read. All the Dark Lord's magical power. In his scar. She rose hastily to her feet. I... I need to go to the bathroom. Wait here, all right? She had to find a grown-up. She had to tell them. It was just a trick, Hermione. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to scare you. A trick? Yes. You asked me to demonstrate my intelligence. 
so I did something apparently impossible, which is always a good way to show off. I can't really do anything just by snapping my fingers. But... but... what did you do then? You think you have what it takes to be a scientist in your own right, with or without my help? Then let's see how you investigate a confusing phenomenon. Hermione's mind went blank for a moment. She loved being tested, but she'd never had a test like this before. Frantically, she tried to cast back for anything she'd read about what scientists were supposed to do. Her mind skipped gears, ground against itself, and spat back the instructions for doing a science fair project. Step 1. Form a hypothesis. Step 2. Do an experiment to test your hypothesis. Step 3. Measure the results. Step 4. Make a cardboard display. Step 1 was to form a hypothesis. That meant, try to think of something that could have happened just now. Alright, my hypothesis is that you cast a charm on my robes to make anything spilled on it vanish. Wait, that's not a very good idea. I didn't see you touch your wand or say any spells, so how could you have cast a charm? But suppose all the robes came from the store with a charm already on them to keep them clean, which would be a very useful sort of charm for them to have. You'd found out by spilling something on yourself earlier. Is that your answer? No, I haven't done step two. Do an experiment to test your hypothesis. Well... The experiment I want to do is pour it on my robes and see what happens, and my prediction is that the stain will disappear. Only if it doesn't work, my robes will be stained and I don't want that. Do it to mine. I have spare robes in my trunk. Alright, since you say so. And she rather gingerly poured a bit of green soda onto a corner of the boy's robes. And the soda vanished. Well, step three was measuring the results, but in this case that was just seeing that the soda had vanished. And she supposed she could probably skip step four about the cardboard display. My answer is that the robes are charmed to keep themselves clean. Not quite. Hermione felt a stab of disappointment. She really wished she wouldn't have felt that way. The boy wasn't a teacher. But it was still a test and she'd gotten a question wrong. And that always felt like a punch in the stomach. It said almost everything you needed to know about Hermione Granger that she had never let that stop her or even let it interfere with her love of being tested. The sad thing is, you probably did everything the book told you to do. You made a prediction that would distinguish between the robe being charmed and not charmed, and you tested it and rejected the null hypothesis that the robe was not charmed. But unless you read the very, very best sort of books, they won't quite teach you how to do science properly. So let me try to explain, without giving away the answer, what you did wrong this time, and I'll give you another chance. She was starting to resent the boy's oh-so-superior tone when he was just another 11-year-old like her, but that was secondary to finding out what she'd done wrong. This is a game based on a famous experiment called the 246 task, and this is how it works. I have a rule, known to me but not to you, which fits some triplets of three numbers, but not others. 246 is one example of a triplet which fits the rule. In fact, let me write down the rule, just so you know it's a fixed rule, and fold it up and give it to you. Now, the way this game works is that you give me a triplet of three numbers, and I'll tell you yes if the three numbers are an instance of the rule, and no if they're not. You already know that 246 gets a yes. Go. 4, 6, 8. Yes. 10, 12, 14. Yes. 1, 3, 5. Yes. Minus 3, minus 1, positive 1. Yes. Hermione couldn't think of anything else to do. It couldn't be that easy, could it? The rule is that the numbers have to increase by 2 each time. Now, suppose I tell you that this test is harder than it looks and that only 20% of grown-ups get it right. Hermione frowned. What had she missed? 2, 5, 8. Yes. 10, 20, 30. Yes. The real answer is that the numbers have to go up by the same amount each time. It doesn't have to be 2. Very well. Take the paper out and see how you did. Hermione took the paper out of her pocket and unfolded it. Three real numbers in increasing order, lowest to highest. Hermione's jaw dropped. What you've just discovered is called positive bias. You had a rule in your mind, and you kept on thinking of triplets that should make the rule say yes. But you didn't try to test as many triplets as possible that should make the rule say no. In fact, you didn't get a single no, so any three numbers could have just as easily been the rule. It's sort of like how people imagine experiments that could confirm their hypotheses instead of trying to imagine experiments that could falsify them. That's not quite exactly the same mistake, but it's close. Now, do you want to take another shot at the original problem? She had an odd feeling that this was the hardest she'd ever been asked to think on a test, or maybe even the first time she'd ever been asked to think on a test. I have an experiment to do. I want to pour some soda on the floor and see if it doesn't vanish. Do you have some paper towels in your pouch so I can mop the soda if this doesn't work? 
I have napkins. Hermione took the soda and poured a small bit of soda onto the floor. A few seconds later, it vanished. Eureka! It was like a compulsion. She had to say it. In fact, she felt like shouting it, but she was just a little too inhibited for that. Of course, you gave me that soda. It's not the robe that's charmed. It was the soda all along. They were interrupted by a weak, tentative, faint, rather reluctant knocking at the door. When Hermione pulled the door open, she was greeted by a trembling young boy who looked exactly like he knocked. Excuse me, I'm Neville Longbottom. I'm looking for my pet toad. I, I can't seem to find it anywhere on this car. Have you seen my toad? No. Have you checked all the other compartments? Yes. Then we'll just have to check all the other cars. I'll help you. My name is Hermione Granger, by the way. Hold on. I'm not sure that's the best way to do it. It's going to take a while to check the whole train by hand, and we might miss the toad anyway. And if we didn't find it by the time we're at Hogwarts, he'd be in trouble. So what would make a lot more sense is if he went directly to the front car, where the prefects are, and asked the prefect for help. They might have spells or magic items that would make it a lot easier to find a toad. We're only first years. Do you think you can make it to the prefect's car on your own? I've sort of got reasons for not wanting to show my face too much. I remember that voice. You're one of the Lords of Chaos! You're the one who gave me candy! I never! Do I look like the sort of villain who would give candy to a child? You're Harry Potter? THE Harry Potter? You? No, just a Harry Potter. There are three of me on this train. Neville gave a small shriek and ran away. Can you please explain to me what's going on? Oh, well, what happened was that Fred and George and I saw this poor small boy at the train station. He was looking really frightened, like he was sure he was about to be attacked by Death Eaters or something. Now, there's a saying that the fear is often worse than the thing itself, so it occurred to me that this was a lad who could actually benefit from seeing his worst nightmare come true and that it wasn't as bad as he feared. And Fred and George came up with the spell to make the scarves over our faces darken and blur like we were undead kings and those were our grave shrouds. And after we were done giving him all the candy I'd bought, we were like, Let's give him some money! Ha ha ha! And dancing around him and laughing evilly and so on. I think there were some people in the crowd who wanted to interfere at first, but bystander apathy held them off at least until they saw what we were doing, and then I think they were all too confused to do anything. Finally, he said in this tiny little whisper, Go away! So the three of us all screamed and ran off, shrieking something about the light burning us. Hopefully, he won't be as scared of being bullied in the future. That's called desensitization therapy, by the way. The burning fire of indignation that was one of Hermione's primary engines sputtered into life, even though part of her did sort of see what they were trying to do. That's awful. You're awful. That poor boy. What you did was mean. You're asking the wrong question. The question is, did it do more good than harm, or more harm than good? That's called consequentialism, by the way. It means that whether an act is right or wrong isn't determined by whether it looks bad or mean or anything like that. The only question is how it will turn out in the end. What are the consequences? What if he has nightmares? Honestly, I don't think he needed our help to have nightmares. And if he has nightmares about this instead, then it'll be nightmares involving horrible monsters who give you chocolate. And that was sort of the whole point. The door slid back to reveal Neville Longbottom. I went to the front car and found a p prefect, but he t told me that prefects weren't to be bothered over little things like missing toads. What were his colors? Green and silver? No, his badge was red and gold. Red and gold? But those are Gryffindor's colors. I suppose that finding some first year's toad isn't heroic enough to be worthy of a Gryffindor prefect. Come on, Neville. I'll come with you this time. We'll see if the boy who lived gets more attention, and he closed the door behind him firmly as he left. Hermione's mind was now so jumbled that she didn't even think she could properly read History A Hogwarts. Well, she did at least know why she was feeling a little sad inside. Maybe Gryffindor wasn't as wonderful as she had thought.